The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today at St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church on this celebration of World Communion Sunday. If this language or concept is unfamiliar, well, then just know that today many congregations all across the world celebrate communion or the Lord's Supper, and we do this with an intentionality to give witness to the global reach of the church in remembering that the church crosses cultural and racial and national and geographic boundaries all over our world. In every Christian denomination, the Lord's Supper or communion is one practice that unites us all together. It is something that all Christian communities consistently observe and have done so for over 2,000 years. No matter how else we might diverge in our beliefs, this is something we hold in common. And so it is in that spirit of unity that we gather today with our friends and fellow Christian folk all around the world. Now also today, we will be celebrating a blessing of the pets service later in the afternoon, and churches typically do this near the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, which was just two days ago. And so we will also be hearing a bit about St. Francis during today's service. And with all of that being said, let us now call ourselves to worship using the printed liturgy found in your bulletin. With every nation, with every land, are you present, O oh God? With compassion and with mercy, do you engage all people everywhere, O oh Lord? Across fertile valleys and tall mountains, across dry deserts and vast oceans, across north and south and east and west, there is no place beyond your infinite love. Alleluia. Amen. Our invocation today on this World Communion Sunday is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Let us pray. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh God, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
Our first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Please stand with me now as you're comfortable or able this morning, and we'll pray together our prayer of confession. Compassionate God, you are the source of all good things. You are the source of all creatures, all people, all nations. But so often we neglect your creation. We forget those who are far away. We turn inward, or we fail to care for those beyond our kith and kin. Grant us a vision that sees beyond borders and divisions. Grant us a heart that is moved by the maligned and the mistreated. Grant us forgiveness and grant us mercy. And may we treat our neighbors just the same. Amen. Friends, trust the good news that healing and grace are readily and abundantly available to you and all people through Christ our Lord. Amen. And in this forgiveness, may we forgive one another. May we seek healing for our world and may we do the things that make for peace. May the peace of Christ be with each of you. And also with you. Let us share signs of God's peace with one another.
for our second reading this morning, I want to lift up the words of the Apostle Paul from one of his letters to the church in the city of Corinth, in which Paul draws a distinction between the wisdom and the logic of the world and the wisdom and the logic of God. As we'll discuss more in the sermon, when looking at the life of St. Francis of Assisi, the values and ways of following Christ can often confound the logic and the values of our world. So let us now read a brief selection from Paul's letter from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, found on page 926 of your pew Bible. And Paul writes, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the one who reasons and debates? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its own wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. Amen. As we move now to our time of giving, I'll invite our ushers to go ahead and come forward for the morning. And as they do, please know that in addition to collecting for our tithes and offerings, that we as a church would like to begin to respond to the devastating floods in western North Carolina and to help those who have been impacted. 
we are planning to work with our denominational partner, the Alliance of Baptists, and to take their recommendations on how best to get funds um, to trusted agencies and impacted people and congregations on the ground there in that part of the state. If you would like, you can earmark a check for North Carolina or hurricane relief or something indicating what it is that you are giving towards. You can make the same notation on an electronic donation as well, whether it's Venmo or PayPal, et cetera. Today is not a deadline for giving for this. We'll collect for a couple of weeks, and, uh, but also not for so long that we can't get funds over to people uh, sooner rather than later. Please continue to remember all of the people who have been so severely impacted by the storms of 10 days ago or so, and let us give with a generous heart and as we're able. Amen. As we come now to our time of prayer this morning, let us begin with a period of silence. And after this time, I'll lead us in spoken prayer. And afterwards, we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer, which we'll say together. Our prayer this morning is adapted in part from another prayer from St. Francis of Assisi, who was known for many things, but especially his sense of seeing God throughout all the created order, from the animals and the moon and the stars and the sun and all of the things that make for our world what it is. And so let us now embrace silence and pray together. Oh, loving God, 
Blessed are you among all the earth. Blessed are you, O God, for from you does all life and all being flow. We give you thanks this morning for the sun, which makes the day and gives us light. It is your bright sun, O God, that shines light and life into our world. And like the sun, we pray that we might see your holy presence shining through all those we meet, whether human or animal or in the rest of the sacred world around us. We give you thanks also, O Lord, for the moon and the stars, reminders that even in darkness, your light nevertheless will illumine our way and will always guide us home. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the wind. May your spirit stir us like the wind and the leaves of the trees. May your spirit be life to us like the breath in our lungs. We thank you, Lord, also for the gift of water. From the deep waters that covered the earth, you brought forth life. And from the waters of the womb, so too did you bring us into life. And in the waters of baptism, you marked us as your own and you raised us to new life in Christ. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the beautiful earth and all therein which sustains us, for the rich diversity of the harvest and for the landscapes that take our breath away and for the simple beauty that is always before us if we but pay attention. For the earth from which we came and for the earth to which we shall return, we give you thanks, O God. And now, O Lord, in a spirit of unity with all those people around the world who seek you and your peaceful ways and your justice and your mercy, unite us in prayer, especially as we now pray together. The prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying in one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our third reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 3. We're reading verses 13 through 15 and the latter part of verse 19 through 21. This is found on page 814 of your pew Bibles. Jesus went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted, and they came to him. And Jesus appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The people accused Jesus of having lost his mind. But Jesus was neither the first nor the last religious person about whom people would make such a claim. And frankly, I have to admit that I have a soft spot for those people, for those individuals who are a little maladjusted for those who color outside the lines a bit, for those who dare to be a bit different from the norms and conventions of their day. This appreciation for the maladjusted is certainly what draws me to the colorful character of St. Francis of Assisi, this much revered but very odd medieval religious figure whom we'll see referenced a good bit around our city this weekend and the next as several churches, including our own, host their blessing of the pet services. In this respect, some of you might know Francis as the beloved medieval saint who revered animals and nature or who preached to the birds, as one famous story recounts. But St. Francis was not simply an animal lover as we might think of it today. Rather, he was also a person, much like our story about Jesus, whom many people thoroughly believed had also lost his mind. For instance, in adulthood, Francis gave away his great wealth and lived a life of austere poverty, calling others to live in a similar way and to follow after him. He did go out and preach to the birds, and one piece of folklore even tell us of his friendship with the great wild wolf. But consider also this morning the following story about our dear St. Francis, and it certainly is a peculiar one. Brace yourselves. This story, like most about St. Francis, is taken from a collection of stories that were written about him some 700 years ago, not long after his death. This story goes this morning that once one of Francis's followers, known as Brother Rufino, that due to his intense spiritual practices, Brother Rufino had become so absorbed in God and in his own inner spirituality that he engaged little with the world around him and he did not preach to the local congregations as did Francis and his other followers. And so one day St. Francis approached and ordered Brother Rufino to go to the town of Assisi and preach to the people. But Brother Rufino was dismayed, and he replied to St. Francis, saying, Reverend Father, I beg you to excuse me and not to send me there, for as you know, I have not the grace of preaching, and rather I am simple and ignorant. To this, St. Francis sternly replied, saying, Brother Rufino, Because you have not obeyed me at once, I therefore order you by holy obedience to go to Assisi naked, with nothing on but your unmentionables, and when you get there, enter a church and thus, naked, preach to the people. At this command, Brother Rufino, remarkably, humbly and obediently stripped himself of all of his clothes and he went to a cc and he promptly entered a church and he preached thus naked to the people now upon seeing this the children and the townspeople began to laugh at poor brother rufino one can only imagine and they said now look 
Francis and his followers, such as this gentleman, they do so much fasting, they do so much penance, they overdo their spirituality so much that they have clearly gone out of their minds. <laughs> this sounds like what they said about Jesus, let us remember. But meanwhile, while this was occurring, St. Francis was moved by Brother Rufino's obedience. And St. Francis also began to think about the perhaps harshness of the order that he had given to him. And so Francis began to reproach himself, saying to himself, where do you get such presumption, Francis, wretched little man that you are? Where do you get off ordering Brother Rufino to go and preach to the people naked like a madman? By God, Francis, he said, continuing to talk to himself, he said, you shall do yourself what you command others to do. And so, at, I warned you in advance, and so at once, in great fervor of spirit, the fervor with which Francis did everything, he stripped himself naked in like manner to Brother Rufino, and he too went to Assisi. And when the townspeople saw him thus also naked, they laughed at him too, thinking now that St. Francis had gone out of his mind as well as had the naked Brother Rufino. But nevertheless, St. Francis, unafraid, and not embarrassed, he proceeded to enter the church where Brother Rufino was just finishing his sermon and St. Francis naked as the day he was born. He went up into the pulpit and he also began to preach and as the story tells us that he preached so marvelously that the good people of Assisi began to be filled with incredible contrition and dedication such as had never been seen before in their little town. Whew. Friends, this is quite a tale. I didn't make this up. This is real. This is quite a tale. And what to do about a story such as this? What do we make of a story such as this? What do we make of a revered religious figure, whether Jesus or St. Francis? What do we do with this when others perceive them to be so odd and so strange? Well, rest assured, I'm not up for me or for anyone to preach in such a manner as did Brother Rufino or St. Francis. But I am reminded of an important teaching, one that puts stories like these in perspective. And the teaching comes from Elie Wiesel, the Jewish Holocaust survivor and author of the book Night, in which Wiesel tells of his experience as a child surviving the madness of a concentration camp. Wiesel, later in life, when he would go on to teach moral philosophy at Yale University, he would teach his students about the importance of what he called being morally maladjusted. And by this, he meant the importance of not letting oneself become accustomed to or accepting of the immoral and dehumanizing influences in our world, whether they be political or cultural or religious. As a child, Wiesel had watched as the Germans and his non-Jewish fellow citizens in Romania accepted or became numb to the moral degradation and the violence that was visited upon the Jewish people and many others stigmatized under Nazi rule. And later in his life, Wiesel studied closely similar genocidal and violent behaviors in other places such as Cambodia, Rwanda, and the Sudan about these eruptions of violence and about these rationalizations of violence, Wiesel would teach his students to always be maladjusted, to not let oneself get pulled into a moral universe where humiliation and degradation and violence toward a person or a group of people was ever acceptable or okay. To illustrate this point, Wiesel often would look back toward the Jewish prophets within his own faith tradition, many of whom acted a bit oddly, certainly, and who challenged abuses of the law and the mistreatment of the poor and the widow and the orphan. The prophets stood out as prophets precisely because they would not accept as normal or okay the political or the religious mistreatment of their vulnerable fellow citizens or the immigrants and foreigners in their midst. 
In other words, people often thought the prophets also had gone out of their minds because they would not let themselves become adjusted to or accepting of a morality that ignored or justified the mistreatment of others. As I was thinking and writing about all of this this week, I was sitting out at Audubon Park yesterday at a picnic table, and I was watching the ducks and the white ibis roaming the green grass of the park searching for food as they're wont to do. And I was sure that if I stood up to preach to them, as Francis preached to the birds, that those people, those good people who were making their laps on the walking track would surely stop and think that I too had gone a bit off kilter, that I had gone out of my mind, you can imagine. And while I didn't preach to the birds, I have found that certain Christian folks have said that they don't necessarily understand the type of Christianity that I practice. And I bet that many of you have found people saying similar things about your faith over the years, that your peculiar practice of Christianity is a bit odd. Perhaps this happened when you spoke up for the rights of the immigrant or the Muslim. Or perhaps when you question some of the morally questionable aspects of our criminal legal system. Or perhaps when over the years you embraced your full sexuality or gender identity and still came to know in your heart that you were indeed a beloved child of God, no matter what other people or other churches may have said. St. Charles St. Charles knows all about people saying these types of things about others, thinking that we have lost our minds, whether from protesters who protested us having a female pastor, as once happened right out there on the front steps of this church, or as we've sponsored good work around anti-racism and Christian nationalism, or perhaps as we've second-lined around our sanctuary during our Mardi Gras services, or in providing nice, free, lunches to the food insecure or in hosting rather fabulous drag show fundraisers or any other number of things that didn't fit neatly into the little box that so many people put Christianity into these days. And as with St. Francis then and as with Elie Wiesel, I do believe that we are and will continue to be called to be a people who are morally maladjusted to the inhumane impulses and values in our world. That no matter what our upcoming election brings, no matter how the world might shift or tilt, that we will be called to question and to seek justice and to stand on the side of what's right and decent, even if decency and goodness are trampled upon or are transfigured into something awful. In other words, and this is our charge for the day, let us always continue to be maladjusted to evil in our world. Let us be maladjusted to anti-immigrant xenophobia. Let us be maladjusted to homophobia and racism and transphobia. Let us not think it okay for the state to put people to death, just as the Roman state once executed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let our consciences always be ill at ease in the face of poverty and injustice and poor housing and underfunded schools. Friends, may we not be afraid to be a bit odd. And if the situation calls for it, may others even say that we too have lost our minds and let us rest in God's grace knowing that we lost them for the sake of the dignity of other human beings and the little birds, and the beloved pets, and the downtrodden, and any of those who are considered irredeemable. Let us keep proudly being this church that we are. Amen, amen. and amen. Let us pray. Oh God, take our thoughts and meditations and fire up our hearts even now and guide us always in the way we should go. Amen. Now, as we 
transition this morning toward the Lord's table. Our celebration of communion will be not very different, but maybe a little different in keeping with our theme of the day. Today, as usual, we will have bread available that has already been broken. It is gluten-free, and you'll be invited uh, as you're able to stand and come forward after our prayer. And after that time, I think most of you know, you'll be given a piece of bread. You can dip it into the chalice, and then you can continue on your way and back to your seat. We have grape juice in the chalice, but also on the table we have a little blue chalice because it's a special day. We have a little blue chalice of real red wine, and it is your discretion if you would like to take your bread and mosey on over to the little blue chalice as well. It'll be there afterwards. It's not going anywhere. You'll also notice that there are other elements on the communion table this morning, things such as grapes and cheese and honey and olive oil. These things are here today because it's a special day, but because in the early, the practice of the early church, communion was always celebrated, usually in home churches or house churches, it was always celebrated around a full regular meal. There were traditions of the Seder that were coming into it as well, and so some of the foods that were available were symbolic, but also meant to be enjoyed as part of a meal. So all that to say, as you come through the communion line this morning, feel free to indulge and to enjoy any of the number of things that are on the table. You can linger for a bit. Uh, if that's not comfortable to you, then you can go back to your seat and we will all be welcomed. Anyone who wants to come back after, uh, after the service is over, these items will be available and highly encouraged for you to take and to enjoy. Also, to say before we get into our prayer of great thanksgiving, I want to emphasize that all people are always welcome at our table. No one is excluded. Everyone is always welcome to come forward. Friends, let our hearts be warmed today by gathering at our Lord's table. And this morning, on this special day, I invite us to do so in a spirit of unity with the many, many people who are gathering around a table such as this across denominational lines, across national borders, across lines of racial and cultural difference, indeed across all our world. Let us remember that although there will always be those who try to divide us around these differences, let us remember that God in Christ always calls us back together again. Amen, and let us pray. O oh, gracious God, from time immemorial, you have called this world into being, creating and sustaining it, calling it good, and always calling out to us, offering us healing for our brokenness and shining a light in our darkness, always offering us a way back home. Remind us all that through this meal, you meet the sinner and the saint, and that you draw no distinction between them. Bless this meal and these elements, O God, the cup and the bread through your Holy Spirit. And bless all those who partake of this meal today all over the world. And may our hearts be filled with joy and nothing less. Amen. And now we give you thanks, O God, that Jesus Christ, our friend and, on, and our teacher, on the night before he died, he took bread... And after giving thanks to you, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given in love for you and for all the world. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of salvation poured out in love for the world. Whenever you drink it, do this to remember me. And so it is, friends, that whenever we eat this bread and drink from this cup with a small degree of madness, do we insist before the world that there is a God whose mercy is deep and whose love for all people truly knows no end. Thanks be to God. Susan, if you would come.
please remember that these elements need a good home after the service is over. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you have put your life into our hands. Now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew us, and remake us. What we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on and take us with you. Amen. Friends, thank you all for being here today. I love this day. I love World Communion Sunday, and I like St. Francis, so we try to hold them both together. Today also, uh, this is one year today that I have been flying solo with you all in this role, and or a variation on the theme, perhaps. Um, but I was thinking about it this morning, and indeed, I've never been flying solo here, um, as so many of you, all of you, support and make all of, none of this is possible without the whole group of us doing what we do. Um, so there is no flying solo here. Thank you to each of you, um, and for all the ways that you've likewise supported me over this time. I want to welcome back today the Cottons as well. So good to... An ever-present digital reality, or virtual reality, we should say, and now here with us in person. That is fantastic. We also welcome Ava, who was with us in the choir this morning. This is Ava, everyone. We'll welcome her as well. Um, next Sunday, we are slated to have our quarterly, uh, this will be the third quarter business meeting. Um, so that is next Sunday, October 13th, following worship. Um, I also want to I lift that up and also want to celebrate, this was from September 28th, a few Saturdays ago, 
the free lunch community meal program served its 500th lunch to those in our neighbor on our neighborhoods and in our communities and so that is a milestone that we lift up and celebrate and think is amazing yeah 500 meals served since starting in april uh yes <laughs> this afternoon 3 p.m 3 p.m 3 p.m i'll say it again um the blessing of the pets service will be right out here in the courtyard it doesn't last very long. Uh, the service itself is probably five, seven minutes or so, and then we'll give a blessing, a little blessing to the pets. There will be things to consume and enjoy for both uh, humans and non-humans alike, and so we'll just spend some time with one another, about 30 minutes or so, or y'all can stay as long as you want, but we will uh, gather and have fun um, about 3 o'clock, 3 to 3.30, something of that nature. Lastly, I'm going to make a personal appeal today, unashamedly, unabashedly, uh, two weeks, less than two weeks from now, is the Mabel Palmer Lecture Series. Um, and the theme this year is, has been announced, and we have flyers everywhere, is uh, on the death penalty in Louisiana. Louisiana's um, current governor has tried to rehabilitate, or is doing so, and the legislature has agreed to try to begin executing people again. There had been about an 8 to 10, maybe 12-year moratorium in practice at least on the death penalty it's been a while since anyone has been executed and there's been all sorts of signs um, and legislation being passed saying that, that they want to renew that and get it going again um, about 10 years ago or so in virginia i was asked i don't know that i deserve to be but i was asked to be on the board of a group called virginians for alternatives to the death penalty and long after I left to come to Louisiana, Virginia was able to successfully abolish the death penalty. And it was the first southern state to do so. Likely is still the only southern state that has done so. Um, and so I reached out to the executive director of what is now, thankfully, a defunct group because there is no more uh, death penalty in Virginia. But I reached out to the executive director, Michael Stone, and he is um, going to come down and be with us on that Saturday night, October the 19th. And he's going to give a lecture. Um, Allison, McCreary, Allison McCreary is also coming. She will be part of a panel discussion along with Michael and someone else afterwards. Um, and then the next day on that Sunday, two weeks from now, Allison McCreary will preach for us. As I'm told, she has preached here before. And so some of you will recognize her and we will welcome her back. She leads, in addition to the many things that she does, she leads a group called Louisianans something against the death penalty. <laughs> the acronym is flying out of my mind, but she leads up that effort. Um, when Caroline and I were with her at Baton Rouge back in the spring, you might remember, and a group of uh, pastors and clergy and religious leaders from across the state when some of those things were happening. So I, my personal appeal is please, if you can, even if this is not a matter of great interest to you, please, if you could make an effort to be here that night, um, that would be wonderful, even if it's just as a favor to me. 6 p.m. October 19th, uh, if you could come that evening. We're putting out, we're advertising as much as we can, and, and we'll continue to do so over the next few weeks. Um, but it will be great to give Michael a warm reception, and um, we're trying to reach out to all of our contacts who are in that world. Um, and ask them to bring all their folks here. And so if you could, if that's possible, be with us that evening. Okay. My personal appeal being over with. Receive now this benediction as we go forward this day in the spirit of St. Francis. May the Lord make you an instrument of peace. Instead of hatred, may you sow love. May you sow pardon instead of revenge. May your faith be strong even when it's hard. May you not despair but have great hope. And may darkness never overwhelm the light in your heart. And may joy and nothing less find you on the way. Amen.
I think they are done by now. But I am, yeah, I am going to walk over.